So um, I'd like to thank Dr. Singer and Dr. Renfrew um, for the invitation to um, speak to you all this morning. And I've been tasked with the job of discussing um, practical screening um, tips that you can do in your offices. And so um, first off, I have my own disclaimer. I have never actually worked in an office PCP setting. I have worked at the Geriatric Assessment Center down at Maine Medical Center. I've also um, worked in hospitals and also long-term care settings. So in many ways, especially in my work now in long-term care settings, I am a PCP, but I also know the challenges um, in a 15, 20-minute visit in a hospital to try and do these kind of screening assessments. So they've been road tested in the primary care offices as well as long-term care facilities as well as um, and also the hospital by myself personally, so I, I know these all have pretty good street cred and are easy to do. Additionally, um, I have no financial conflicts of interest, and all of the materials presented today are freely available on the internet for public use. This is not only on um, the London and Dean um, website, but Maine Health and other websites as well. If you do a quick Google search, you can get any of this information for your use. So the objectives of the talk today are to talk about um, three specific tests. There are a bazillion different screening tests out there, but these are my three favorites um, among others. One is the confusion assessment method, which is actually not a screening test for dementia, but it is for delirium. And when we're thinking about any kind of change in cognition, we need to uh, figure out whether it's acute or whether it may be chronic, because timeline really helps us um, determine the differential. Also, we're going to talk a little bit about the MINICOG, which is a five-minute test that, um, again, has been recommended in many different places as a screening test for um, dementia. And then we're going to talk about a formal test to assess the IADLs, the Lott and Brody scale. We'll talk about its formal application as well as an informal application um, and how it may assist in determining whether a patient may have dementia or not. So that's what the objectives are. So in short, we're going to talk a little bit about um, why screening is important, the role of the PCP, and um, some things that have been um, recently enacted over the last few years to support screening for dementia within people's practices, and then talk for, um, about tools for cognitive and functional assessment using the three tools I discussed earlier. Now the interesting thing to start, a or ta start our symposium today on dementia is the interesting thing about screening tests is there is actually no direct evidence that doing this helps anyone when we talk about the actual literature out there. Um, most of the, and this is for a lot of reasons, um, often that the studies designed to, to look at screening directly doesn't show that there is a direct re relationship between doing the mini-cog and having an improvement in outcomes. But that being said, we're, we're from Maine, right? We're all pretty practical people. If it seems like it makes sense, probably does, right? And so reason, the reason we screen for dementia is because maybe the screening itself doesn't, but understanding that a patient may have cognitive impairment will lead to early medical um, interventions, social interventions, and behavioral interventions that does make a market impact in the care for, of that patient, and that is what impacts outcomes. So if we can't, you know, if, if we don't recognize that somebody's having an issue, how do we treat it? How do we discuss it? How do we think about um, the safety implications for that, that patient. And so the be there are multiple benefits of detection, uh, early detection of dementia, um, including possible discovery of reversible causes of cognitive impairment. We've all had that patient who has had you know, a subacute decline and comes in and their sodium is 119, or they have a hypercalcemia that you've never seen before, or they have some kind of electrolyte abnormality, or they may have fallen on a blood thinner and may have had a subdural. There's, there's real reversible causes to cognitive impairment that detection of the cognitive impairment is helpful to determine. Also, there's early use of potential symptom-modifying medications, and we'll discuss that um, later on. There's also enrollment in clinical trials for experimental therapies. Again, we'll be talking about that later. And also, more importantly, there's going to be, um, there's avoidance of certain medical regimens that also may worsen cognition. <coughs> If people have a vulnerability um, inherently due to their um, neurodegenerative process, it goes to, um, it, it, it makes sense that they may have increased vulnerability to certain medications that affect the CNS, um, such as benzodiazepines or other hypnotics or sedatives that can really cause increased confusion. So determining that a person may have this vulnerability will um, help with that as well. 
Additionally, um, and this is probably maybe the most impactful for people with dementia at this stage, is that it will also lead to anticipatory planning about future care needs, personal and public safety issues, especially around driving and other things, and also caregiver education and resources. And the reason I go first is this talk and all these benefits kind of leads up to the rest of the day. So everybody else will talk about these in, in sequential order. So again, as Dr. Renfrew said earlier, the thing is about dementia is it's very common. It's very common, but more than 50% of people with dementia don't have the diagnosis in their medical record. So if we don't know about it, we don't communicate it with our, our fellow colleagues, does it exist? You know, does it, if a tree falls in a forest and no one hears it, you know? And this kind of thing, and the trick is with Alzheimer's disease in particular, most patients have it for two to six years prior to getting a diagnosis. And that's a fair, a fair period of time. And most patients are not diagnosed until the moderate stage of disease. And moderate is really when it starts to affect ADL, so the basic care you know, practices, bathing, dressing, choosing clothes. These are the things that people can really notice. And it's, it seems like if we could maybe catch it earlier, then we could um, allow them to really be a more of a participant in their future care plannings and so on. So the solution really is primary care. Um, primary care practitioners are in a unique position to detect cognitive and functional decline. First off, they provide the majority of care for older adults. And they're usually the first point of contact for patients and caregivers when they have memory concerns. And, and just the way it is, is 80% of dementia care is provided by the PCPs. Not a geriatrician, not, you know, PCPs in the community do do the bulk of the care. So you are in a unique position to do this. And so, of course, because of the importance, and even though, um, you know, Dr. Um, Fail and all, who did um, looked at the quality um, ACOV measures for um, dementia, they recognized even though that screening wasn't necessarily evidence-based in that it improved outcomes, they felt that cognitive and functional screening was very important. And they felt if a vulnerable elder is new to a primary care practice or an inpatient service, then there should be a documented assessment of cognitive ability and functional status. And all vulnerable elders should be evaluated annually for changes in memory and function. This is their first of their 17 recommendations and therefore, um, you know, stresses the importance of this intervention. So again, that's who they recommend. Practically though, who do we, who is candidates for cognitive assessment? Well, first off, individuals who have cognitive complaints. If they come in and they don't think their memory is quite the way it used to be, then those are the ones we should screen. And that's with or without functional impairment. And we'll talk about the importance of doing a good functional history in the determination of um, dementia, a dementia diagnosis. The other people to pay attention to is everybody else who knows that patient. <laughs> so the children, the daughter-in-law from away who talks to mom once a week and thinks she's slipping a little bit, the postman, the, la you know, the ladies in the front office, the bank teller. I've had a couple people come to the geriatric assessment because the bank teller called the doctor because Mrs. So-and-so was parking diagonally in the parking spaces. I mean, in a small town, I am from Maine, I'm from the mid-coast originally, everybody knows everybody. And so people know this stuff is out there and they may not feel like they want to approach the patient directly, but they will talk to almost everybody else who cares about that patient in a roundabout way. So really trust that. If you hear it, you know, hear it once maybe, but if you hear it more than once, it really is somebody who should do that. Also, again, you know, when you think about um, individuals, it's not necessarily cognitive impairment that we see first. It may be functional impairment or um, a change in how they behave or look. So for example, if somebody was always perfectly coiffed and had, you know, looked like a million bucks and all of a sudden their mascara is crooked or their hair doesn't look quite right, or um, they're the individuals who, um, you know, be, may be wearing shorts on a day like today, unless they're a high school kid, you know, they will wear them starting now. Um, at least in Portland, they're doing it right already. But those are the kind of, you know, things that you can trigger as well as, for example, what if they had a perfectly controlled hemoglobin A1C? It was perfect. And all of a sudden it creeps from, you know, seven to eight to nine to 9.5. And is it because they're not taking their medications? Why aren't they taking the medications? Could be they think they are and they're forgetting and so on. Also the thing is um, depression is one of those things that often people will also recognize even more before cognitive impairments. Um, crankiness, changes in personality, changes in motivation. 
Again, um, that's something that may come to people's attention beforehand. And again, as I said, deterioration of chronic disease states without explanation is always a, a red flag. So again, the solution is primary care. And the federal government has recognized this. And as part of the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act that was enacted in 2010, they've actually put as part of the Medicare annual wellness visit, um, they put um, detection of cognitive impairment as part of, of this workup. So it's one of the things that they stress as well as part of um, establishing and maintaining a personalized prevention plan. So there are mechanisms for reimbursement for this as well. Now, that being said, screening isn't always easy, though. I mean, first off, I swear dementia and falls are the two things people would rather have their eye teeth yanked than admit to, because most, of, most times they're threats to independence, and they are afraid that if people know, they may end up in, in a nursing home or someplace else. So a lot of people will um, be fearful of talking about it, and also, um, not only a patient, but family members will be fearful of talking about it in the office because they have to ride with their loved one on the way home. And so they may be frank in your office, but they're going to hear about it for the next 20 minutes and probably for the next two weeks afterwards. So it's something that is hard, uh, a hard subject for fa patients and families to um, broach. The other thing about memory loss, depending on the type of it, is people forget they have it. And so insight is also something that is very difficult at times and may make it particularly difficult to um, do an interview about memory loss, especially if they're the sole report, you know, informant. So it's always good to have somebody else, if possible, to um, corroborate the history. There's also something that Dr. Campbell down at P6 calls frustration tolerance, a decreased frustration tolerance, AKA you give them the screening test and they ball it up in a little wad of paper and throw it back at you and say, I'm not doing it. That has happened, but again, you know, it's one of those things is that in of itself, I think, is a prognostic marker and the fact that they're afraid of some reason, you know, and it could be literacy level or education level. So that is something that also needs to be parsed out on that. It could also be visual and hearing impairment um, related, but often it can be just due to the changes um, that you see with a neurodegenerative disease. So it is something to think about in and of itself. The other thing that's a barrier to screening is if the patient comes in by themselves because it takes a fair amount of impairment that, um, that somebody has difficulty to the point where you can, a casual observer can see it. So again, if a patient is living at home and making it to appointments, you know, they're coming, so everybody thinks it's okay, and you ask them, so how's things going at home? How's, you know, housework? Oh, I'm fine, I'm doing fine, no problem, no problem, no problem. And then it's not until, again, the daughter from the way calls and says, you know, I really am worried about mom, that we start kind of un uncovering it. So again, um, if you don't have a secondary informant, that can be very difficult. There are also barriers to, um, to providers doing it, and these are just a, you know, the, the three biggest ones people think about. One is time, you know, time, time, time. Another one is reimbursement, because doing a, a proper cognitive eval and in screening informants and calling people on the phone takes a chunk of time. It takes a while. And um, also, some people often have, um, especially if it's someone you've taken care of for, of for a long time, I actually had this at the geriatric assessment where I had a patient of mine who had dementia and I had followed him for five years, is now in a nursing home. His wife showed up the next, you know, just showed up for her own cognitive in, um, evaluation. It nearly broke my heart because I, I, you know, I'd been so much through so much with her and now she's coming in with memory impairments. And for me, that was. A true, a true moment of discomfort for myself, even though I'm used to doing this, I didn't want to think the worst for them. I, didn't, I knew what was going to happen if this testing went bad, and I didn't want her for that. So there's a, not only an emotional and affective um, barrier, but there's also, you know, well, if I do this, what is it going to mean? You know, kind of discomforts about the issues and so on, and hopefully we can dispel some of that discomfort today about giving people more resources and education. So, but again, you know, to overcome, again, those barriers of time and money, it, it takes a village, you know. <laughs> Memory loss takes the whole practice, and as Dr. Renfrew said, the community. You're not alone in this. Anyone from the people who work up front in medical records all the way um, through the MA, the secretary, you know, everybody can help you with this. Um, one of the most, probably one of the easiest people to think about is the MA who can help you and assist you with a lot of these testing. It does not take a physician to do these tests. I am, again, li living proof of that. I actually worked at a memory and mo movement disorders unit um, right out of college. I had less clinical acumen than almost anybody else I knew at that point in time. I've never, never worked with patients. And yet I did the cognitive battery of testing for Mass General for two years. 
And so if they let me do it, um, anyone can do it. And so, um, again, this is something that you don't have to be a medical professional to do, or a medical professional to do it. So allow anybody around who, if you have those resources in your office, um, just please, please take advantage of them. Because anyone, as I said before, can suspect dementia. Um, the things to ask yourself or to ask people who come with you with these concerns is, are the changes new? Okay, okay, they're new. New how, when? You know, new in the last couple weeks, new in the last couple months, new in the last couple of years. How long have they had their symptoms? How, what is their self, um, their care at baseline? So how can they um, manage their household? How are they managing their finances? How do they manage their self-care? What objective data do we know that is, can back up our suspicions? Are they missing appointments? Again, are this the one who, um, you call the pharmacy and they haven't refilled their med in six months, eight months, a year. Is it because, um, you know, when was the last time they called for a refill? You know, one of those things. Um, again, you know, are they confused when they call at the office? Are there multiple no-shows? No, do they notice differences in dress and behavior? Anyone can notice these things. And really the key is to have um, that relationship with your staff that they feel comfortable in letting you know these things. Because sometimes, again, um, it's people are very reluctant sometimes to talk about these things openly because they're fearful of the consequences. You know, the, your MA may not approach you or somebody else may not approach you with this information unless they feel comfortable in the fact that, um, that you're welcome this information to help you determine the best for, um, for the patient. And again, you know, HIPAA, HIPAA makes sometimes this a little difficult. But again, if you see something and they brought, their daughter drove them and they're waiting in the waiting room, ask permission to talk to them and see if you can get some corroboration and ask the same questions. And again, because family and friends, as, as um, Dr. Renfrew said earlier, are basically providing the, the vast majority of the care for these individuals, um, and they really should be vigilant for the changes. They should be told um, to let care providers know immediately if they observe a change in behavior. Again, this is important for both dementia, but what if something else? Again, what if it's a delirium that may be complicating this? and that um, they may actually have a medical emergency that may be causing some of these um, changes. They should also know that any change in behavior and thinking should be reported immediately for those very issues. So the, let's talk a little bit about the detection tests. So we're gonna start first with the cognitive testing and talk about the CAM and the MINICOG and then we'll move on to the IADL scale. So the thing is, the trick about cognition and cognitive assessment is we really need to figure out the timeline. And really, more importantly, we need to figure out whether they have delirium, dementia, or both. And so let's talk a little bit about that. Delirium is a sudden change in cognition. So it doesn't have to be three minutes ago. It can be a couple weeks ago. But it's clearly a sudden change in cognition. And it's often characterized by fluctuation, the classic waxing and waning that people hear about, like the phases of the moon and so on. Um, and it's also a fundamental um, alteration in the ability to attend to a human being. So people are very inattentive, they wander off cognitively. And they can also feature um, or disorganization of disorganized thinking and or changes in activity of um, level or changes in level of activity. Now the disorganized thinking we'll talk about a little bit, but those are the ones you get when you're doing a history, you're more confused than they are by the time you're done with it. <laughs> that kind of transference may be indication that they have disorganized thinking. And the changes in level of activity could be the hyperactive deliriums that we sometimes associate, the help me, help me, help me, bed alarm, bed alarm, bed alarm. But often they can be also hypoactive, so the people who are more sleepy, sedentary, um, you know, apathetic, just don't seem right, they just seem um, that they've shut down. And those in many ways um, are more concerning to me. Because if it's delirium, it's important because, again, it may be reversible if the underlying causes are identified and treated. Dementia, by contrast, is an often slow, irreversible process that causes progressive loss of memory, problem solving, and word finding. And the trick is it has to be severe enough to impact daily function, and that's why we focus on the ADL screen, or IADL screen in a, in a minute. So determining the two is very important. So again, time course is important. If the changes in thinking and behavior are new, hours to days, they may have the delirium. If the changes have been noticed over months to years, they may have dementia. And clearly what we hear is, mom's been kind of fading for a couple of years, but then she fell off the cliff. And if you hear the terms fell off a cliff or hit a wall, um, or, you know, and sometimes people not familiar with this will say she went nuts last night or something like that, 
that's clearly a, a, a mention of acuity that um, makes you, at least makes me think that she has, um, has a delirium. So let's talk about the confusion assessment method because this is one way, a quick bedside um, screen to determine whether somebody has delirium or not. Commonly known as a CAM, it's a screening tool that was, um, has been developed to identify delirium. It's been around since the 90s. And um, although the, the test characteristics um, vary, it's anywhere between 90 and like 95% sensitive and specific for um, screening of um, dementia. What they, how it was developed is they looked at the DSM-4 cr um, criteria for delirium, and then they actually tested it against psychiatrists. Um, so they t did it, they had somebody do it, and then they had a psychiatrist formally evaluate whether the patient had delirium or not, and then they did a correlation. So that's how it was originally developed. It takes less than five minutes to complete, and generally um, I can do it, sometimes you can do it at the doorway, but often you can do it um, talking to them. And there's really two parts. It's either, um, there's a required element and an either or section. So to perform the CAM, you have to ask yourself five questions, really. And the, one of the first questions, again, and I keep harping on this, are the changes new? Does it have an acute onset? Does it fluctuate? Does it come and go? And it doesn't have to be a rapid fluctuation. They just have to have good moments, bad moments, in a relatively you know, reasonable amount of time. And then the third question, again, is the, does the patient have difficulty paying attention? The answer to all these three questions must be yes. This is the mandatory portion of this test. So they, the changes must be new, they must fluctuate, and they, cannot pay, they must not be able to pay attention. So those are the three ones. Now, there are some formalized ways to, of testing attention, and I actually, every time I meet a new patient that may or may not have cognitive testing or at least is acutely ill, I'll go to them and say, hi, nice to meet you, I'm Sarah Hallen, I'm one of the doctors. Before we get any further, I want to ask you a really silly question. And what I do is and then I do the five-digit span. And I use the same five digits that I have always used because I have a lack of attention at times. And so they're a variation of my home phone number when I was a kid, two, three, six, four, one. And so most people, if they are attentive to me, in, even if they have a fairly moderate degree of dementia, can say that right back to me, two, three, six, four, one. Then because I'm often a little bit meaner than that, I, that's my first screen. So if they have that, I know they have a basic fundamental of attention, level of attention. But then I ask them to say the days of the week backwards for me. So I'll say, hi, I'm Sarah Hallen. I want you to do a couple silly things. Repeat these five digits. Now I want you to say the days of the week for me, starting with Monday. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and they'll do that. And then I say, okay, now starting with Friday, I'd like you to say the days of the week backwards for me. And even though some people can do the five digits band forwards, that saying the days of the week backwards is, a ve is very hard for people if they have any element of delirium or a resolving delirium. Because it takes learned information that you know, and it allows you, to, it requires the frontal lobes to put on the brakes and not continue going Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and actually work backwards. So again, um, I like days of the week backwards because it's easier with hearing impairment. There are other tests that um, are out there, such as spelling the word world backwards, but nobody with hearing impairment knows what world actually is. Some people then say, um, spell the word truck, but then that could be, they hear that one incorrectly, it could be awkward. Um, <laughs> and so I've had that happen as well. Um, the other things is counting backwards from 20 to one. Um, the serial sevens test, so counting backwards from 100 by sevens. That one is supposed to be calculation, but what it really is is a test of attention. So again, it's really important to establish whether they have these things because the mini mental, five points are spelling the word world backwards or serial sevens. And if they have delirium and cannot attend, they're automatically five points off. So it's really important to determine whether a patient may have delirium or not before you go on with um, further testing. So the first three must be yes. So they must be new, the changes must be new, they must have an acute onset, they must fluctuate, and they have to have difficulty paying attention. Now those are the three that must be yes. The other two, only one has to be right. Is their thinking disorganized or do they have a change in their level of um, activation? Are they sleeping unresponsive or are they agitated and active? Again, the second one, uh, the, you know, the, the second question you kind of tell from the, the doorway, it's one of those things. But disorganized, disorganized thinking um, can be a little bit difficult to ascertain sometimes. I like to think it's like the Supreme Court, um, Supreme Court um, definition of pornography. You kind of know it when you see it. Again, you know, if they have a disorganized history, they can't complete a thought, 
then that's often it. But if you aren't sure, there are some formal tests you can do. Um, these are some questions that are um, commonly used. Will a stone float on water? Are there fish in the sea? Does one pound weigh more than two pounds? Can you use a hammer to pound a nail? I would, I would keep these in your back pocket unless you're pretty sure they do have disorganized thinking because often you know, that decreased frustration tolerance will come out if you say, you know, can you use a hammer to pound a nail? Oh, of course you can. Why are you asking me these stupid questions? So again, these may be used if you really don't um, think you have a good handle on what they're, um, think, whether their thinking is organized or not. So let's go to the mini cog since we're not going to be, if we now we're assuming our patient has passed the, the screening for delirium and that their cognitive, they don't have delirium probably at this point. And so the mini cog, again, is a cognitive impairment screening test for primary care settings. This is what it was developed for. This tool can be administered in three minutes. And it says it doesn't require any special equipment. It does require a pen and pencil, which may be a barrier to some people. And again, it has very good sensitivity and specificity. Um, the sensitivity report is anywhere between 76 and 99%, and the specificity from 89 to 93%. And actually, with all these testing, um, the characteristics are very similar. And if you imagine any of your other diagnostic tests having these same kind of characteristics, it's kind of laughable. <laughs> you know, even CTPE testing and stuff may not have the same um, degree of sensitivity and specificity. And the nice thing about the MINICOG is it's been shown to be effectively used in multilingual populations with diverse socioeconomic status and education level. So there's three parts to it again. Um, there's a registration, there's a clock draw test, and then there is a three-word recall. And so what is the registration? It's basically asking them to remember three words. The same three words I always use, again, I have attention issues at times, is apple, table, penny. You're to say each word with a one second pause between them. And if they can't repeat all of them um, at once, say them again. And you can repeat them up to five times. The trick is if it takes five times to encode three words, put a little asterisk there. Because again, that might be a soft sign that something may be going on that um, is a, a cognitive issue. Um, and then again, you instruct the patient, remember these three words, because I'll ask them to repeat, um, ask you to repeat them later. The second step is a clock draw. And in the classic way to do this, we, um, we provide the patient with a pre-drawn circle. And most of us, if we're going to do it, make it a big circle. Um, because what your next task is, is to ask them to place the numbers so they look like the face of the clock. If you give them a big circle and they have difficulties with executive function or motor planning, the number 12 is going to start here. And by the time they hit 8, they're right about here. Because they can't, they can't space it correctly. Um, and so it's, it's important to not give them a too small a circle. Make it, make it a pretty good circle. And then after they're done putting the, um, the numbers on, ask them to place the hands of the clock so it reads 10 after 11. There's a couple reasons we use that. First, it's linguistically challenging. But other people say we use that number because it's actually two visual fields. So it's on both sides of the clock as well. That's one of the rationale I, I've heard for it. And so that's, that's the clock draw. So that's you ask them the three words, so remember three words, do the clock draw. And then, um, and then we ask them to remember the three words. The trick is you're not supposed to give any hints or clues. So that's the purest way. Sometimes people will score it this way and then give hints or clues to see if they got in any way. But again, that is more for your own education and not a formal part of the, the testing. Okay. And so that to score the test, it's pretty easy. All numbers must be present in the right sequence, and it you know, has to be all there, not too many, not too few. Um, so you'll see some people put hash marks. They need to be numbers. Roman numerals are OK. Some people will do that. Um, the two hands, um, to be do a strict um, scoring of this, the long hand must point to the 10. The short hand must be, um, point to the 11. This gentleman who's doing this on the thing is doing a very nice job of his clock. I'd give him full credit for that. And then, um, and then the patient must be able to remember all three words correctly. Now the thing is, um, when Dr. Borson um, did this initially, this was the algorithm for scoring that um, she published with the paper. And as you can see here, it doesn't look much like a screening tool. It almost looks like a diagnosis tool because it has dementia and non-demented. Remember, that's not the, really the intent of this. It's basically to, to give you an indication may, that someone may or may not have dementia. And so to, to score as having deme to be demented by this test, you either have, can't remember any of the three words, or you can only remember one to two of them, and your clock draw is abnormal. 
But most of the clinicians I've talked to about this don't, you know, are kind of like, this is kind of a strict interpretation. Because honestly, if they remember all three words and their clock draw is bad, I'm still going to think something's up. Okay? That doesn't mean that things aren't normal. Because really, people can have disexecutive dementias where their planning and motor skills, and, or not their motor skills, but their planning and um, spatial skills are disrupted first, and their memory can be somewhat intact. So again, I, the way I've always done it is kind of qualitatively is, and use my best judgment. But actually, Dr. Renfrew spoke to doc, um, wrote to Dr. Borson, and he has his own qualitative way of doing, or quantitative way of doing it, where each of the sections have one point. So you get three points for all the three recalls, and then two points for the clock, as long as the hands are correct and it's, the numbers are in the correct order. And so the more points are better on this scale, so four or five are normal. And if you only get two points, then zero to two points, that's abnormal. But again, there's that wiggle room. What if, what if you got a three? What if, again, in some cases, the, the strict way of doing it is to draw um, the circle for the patient. But oftentimes, I, like Dr. Renfrew, have them do their first crack first. And if they make a little bitty circle, and you can't put 12 numbers in that, you know there's something up. Again, if you know, they draw a square, I've seen them do that. Um, that, again, is a point off. And, you know, things like that. So, Again, you know, these are screening tests, but then clinical judgment in their interpretation should be used. So, again, if you have a three or so, the question is, do, are they demented? Do they have MCI? You know, mild cognitive impairment is something that's just starting to show up, is showing up now. What, what's going on? So, again, the trick, as I said before, when you're doing any kind of cognitive testing, if the CAM is positive, a.k.a. they have delirium, it will likely impact the results of the mini-cog. Because how are you going to attend and register three words if you can't attend? Okay, so any cognitive testing. Also, disorganized thinking will make it very difficult to figure out what 10 past 11 means. So again, if they have delirium, you really need to interpret the tests, any kind of cognitive tests, with caution. And of course, pl please, when you have your office staff and or nurses doing this, please reassure them they are not diagnosing a patient with dementia. When we did these tests, we introduced um, the CAM to all the nursing staff at Maine Medical Center, and most of them really didn't, weren't comfortable initially because they felt like they were d diagnosing people with delirium. It's not. It's a screening test for it. It's like, in many ways, like get, taking a pulse ox, and if they have a pulse ox at 88, you have just screened them for hypoxia. You did not necessarily diagnose why they're hypoxic, and that's a way of thinking about it. I actually think that the CAM should be treated as a vital sign in many cases as, as, as the... Um, as a mini-cog, as a hint that more workup is necessary. So that's the mini-cog. Any questions before we go on to the last of our tests? Yes, sir. As we get away from analog time to digital time, <laughs> when do you foresee the clock draw? So that's an interesting question. Um, I have a second grader who is in the main school system, and she, she is being taught to t do, you know, do an analog clock. So I have a feeling she'll be safe. <laughs> So unless they give it up direct, you know, eventually in all of education, we should be safe. That being said, the check writing that we sometimes use as part of our cognitive screens, that one's going to be gone next year. Um, <laughs> I think that one will be gone soon. But in that case, it will probably be replaced with, can you, you know, how do you format an email or something like that? Who goes in the two line? Who goes into the front line? That kind of thing. So um, all right, so let's do um, the Lott and Brody scale. And I want to make sure that I still have some time, yes. And so um, the Lott and Brody scale is an old scale. This was developed in the 1960s. And at that time, they didn't feel the need to actually test its sensitivity or specificity at that point in time, because it wasn't under the same rigor. The thing is, it was the, the purpose of um, it was to assess independent living skills. So I'm, I'm sure this audience knows the difference between the ADLs and the IADLs. But just for a quick review, ADLs are the activities of, um, of ba basic daily living. And so what the ADLs are, are bathing, dressing, eating, you know, hygiene, walking, things like that. ADLs, if you are independent with your ADLs, you can live in a supportive environment. And so, um, for example, um, I have 19-month-old um, twins at home. And they are not independent with their ADLs. <laughs> So they could not live in a supportive environment whatsoever. You know, I am, I, am, I am clearly in charge of them. And if they were in the community, my babies would be qualified for nursing home level of care for that very reason. So that's why the ADLs are important, because if you can't bathe and wash yourself, you can't even necessarily live independently with a supportive environment. 
Your IADLs are the instrumental activities of daily living. So I remember instrument because you need an instrument to perform them. So usually electricity, heavy machinery, something like that, a knife, things like that. You need something to perform them. And these are the, um, the cooking, cleaning, bill paying, driving, um, medication management. These are the things that we learned in our teenagehood and early college that allowed us to hopefully live independently as adults in the community. So if you're independent with your IADLs, you can live independently. If you need help with your IADLs, generally you need help in a supportive environment or would qualify for assisted living level of care. And so my five-year-old and my eight-year-old daughters, I, I provide a very nice assisted living level of care for both of them with you know, adult daycare in the morning and I take care of them at night. So again, this is why these are important, not only for um, screening tests, but also it somewhat allows you the, the level of care that these individuals may require. So that's one thing to think about. The other thing is if a patient was living successfully and independently in the community and no longer can be because they have difficulty um, doing their independent living skills, then there's something going on, okay? It could be, it could be functional debility due to comorbidity, but more likely it's probably, it may be cognitive, it could be something going on, but if they could live independently in the community and no longer can do so, then that's something that needs further assessment. And again, because they, this is an I-80 ALE scale, it's not appropriate for institutionalized patients because that's what the, they're in the institution for, <laughs> is support with many of these. And again, it's a very much a useful adjunct to cognitive testing, and in many ways, it may be more sensitive in early impairment because one of the first things that people come to us about is mom screwed up the checkbook, or mom screwed up her pills, or there's nothing but the same six things in her shelves because every time she goes to the grocery store, she buys the six, same six things, those kind of things. Those are the things that family members first. And therefore, this may be more sensitive in some ways to cognitive impairment than other testing. The trick is it uses self-reported information, and we already know how fallible that can be. And so often, I wouldn't take this as the sole truth. Again, get a second opinion if you can. And it can be, if we use the formal scale, it can take 10 to 15 minutes to administer depending on the technique. And also, when you look at the scale, remember it was developed in the 1960s. So again, um, when the ability to use a telephone, so number one, operates telephone on initiative, looks up and dials numbers. Again, um, in, in, this, in this setting, um, the scores um, go from zero to eight. And so in this one, um, higher numbers are, are better. So again, operates the telephone numbers, dials a few known numbers, and you, um, but does not dial. So you can see that each one of these has its own particular item and you get the point for that. The trick is I wouldn't necessarily say using ability to use the telephone independently is if you can't dial the number. If you just pick it up, I wouldn't necessarily give somebody full credit for that. So again, I like, you know, so this has some drawbacks to it. Again, um, shops independently for small purchases, needs to be accompanied on every shopping trip and so on. And you can look through the, the rest of the, um, the items. Um, so the trick is with this one is that I often don't use the skill formally, but I ask the same questions. So I don't score it, but I, I try to ask each of these domains. The other thing with the Lawton, because it was, um, it was developed in the 1960s and roles of men and women were traditionally very different. Men are generally not scored on domains of food preparation, housekeeping, or laundering. So make your own little statement about that. But that's, if you do this um, that way, that's generally the way it is. And again, scores range from zero to eight, fully dependent, um, dependent to fully independent. But again, I don't think the, the, I don't think using that, I wanted to present this last one, not necessarily to advocate to use this screening tests like I did the mini, uh, the mini cog in the cam, but more to be aware of the questions and the domains because I think that's the important thing to get from the information, that social history, that functional history. Because of course, the differences between say somebody with mini, um, mild cognitive impairment and dementia is the functional piece of it. If they cannot, if the memory and the cognitive changes have gotten to the point where they affect day to day, um, day-to-day -day, um, function, then it, it does qualify as a dementia. So the other thing we didn't talk about, but something we may have to consider, is when people come to us with concerns about memory loss. Again, things we need to screen for are um, visual and hearing impairment, things like that. 
but also depression really is something that we really should look at as well. Um, I'm not going to go into it right now, but again, please be aware that screening for depression is rec um, recommended annually. And of course, it may mimic dementia in the fact that depression affects attention and attention is key to everything else. If you cannot attend to somebody, you are not gonna pay attention and remember those three words. So even if your memory is generally okay, depression can certainly affect it. Of course, sleep, appetite, and irritability, the more classic um, you know, vegetative symptoms can also happen in older adults as well. And the irritability piece is probably what I see most frequently, is people um, you know, get, get cranky and they don't feel like everything stinks and uh, it's not worth it. And so when those are the primary, you know, the um, it's a part of the pres presentation, really do consider depression. There are a number of um, screening tools out there. The PHQ-9 is the one that um, is often recommended. We all, I also like the geriatric um, depression scale, the short form, the 15.1 as well. But regardless, um, think about depression and the, the scoring tools out there available to you. So the final take home points, and we'll leave a few minutes for questions and transitions is dementia is common and often missed. And screening is important because of multiple and personal and public safety hazards. And these can be avoided with proper foresight and planning. Again, please, when you utilize staff, reassure them that screening does not equal diagnosis. And whenever possible, please be aware that you aren't the one who has to do it. Please utilize your staff and um, utilize your team. So thank you for your attention. And any questions? Oh, yep. If you have a patient that you've identified, that you do a full screen on, I, I usually use the slums. Mm -hmm. um, and the slums scores at mild neurocognitive disorder. If you administer a, a functional test and it's abnormal, does that swing you to yes. say this is really dementia, yes. not? And, and vice versa as well. So if I have, if I have it on good authority that the patient is perfectly able to do all of their day-to-day -day tasks and they have a, a mild cognitive impairment in my in my and we'll ask the other speakers as they come up we can ask them similar questions but if they um, if they are cognitively intact and have function or have cognitive impairment and have functional impairment I am swung more towards the mild dementia diagnosis if they have cognitive impairment but are functionally intact and I have that on good authority because remember responsible for eight IADLs does not equal competency at them so, you know, even though they're, they're the ones doing it, doesn't mean that they're good at it. So, again, if I have a good authority that they are per successfully performing it in that kind of gray area, then I would probably stick with mild cognitive impairment. And you also have to rec realize with any of these testing, and I'm sure the other presenters will talk about that, education level and also previous level of function is a big indicator. So, for example, if somebody was a Colby professor and, you know, had, you know, very, very intelligent, very smart, and now is having difficulty you know, writing emails. And even though they may score perfectly in all the testing, not just the screening test, but say the more advanced cognitive testing, I'd still worry about them. I'd still worry about them because again, they may, they may hit that ceiling effect where they doesn't quite reach where they have their level of impairment. So again, all of this, um, you know, these are tests. We use them to supply ourselves with objective data that we can follow over time, but never take the clinician out of it. I mean, I think judgment is, is equally important in all these realms. Other questions? Yep. Do you have any tools you've used to give family members, especially if you're often seeing the patient alone, but they agree to let a family member provide information? Um, you use I, that to so send there's them? a couple different ways of doing it. Um, sometimes people I've seen send packets home and things like that. I often just call them, but I have the luxury of time to do that sometimes because I find that five minutes can sometimes have a better yield than trying to give them something and hoping that they'll bring it back. That being said, I get lots of love notes, um, too. Um, a lot of love notes from families or daughters or didn't want to say it in from a mom, but these are the things I'm concerned about. And so those are equally valuable. So often, if I don't necessarily have a formal thing that I give them, but I accept all, all other forms of correspondence if, they, if they'd like to reach out and tell me these issues. Yeah. Uh, I, I can talk maybe yeah. a little bit that. Thank you, Heidi. This is excellent. I appreciate hearing this. Yeah. Um, at our clinic, we sometimes give the family member the video. We ask permission and we give them the ADA. It's an eight question uh, questionnaire about their functioning and how they're doing at home. I think we got that from you.
Yeah, we actually, at the, the comp, at the geriatric center, we have the luxury of having a social work meet with the family while we're meeting with the patient or they're undergoing their occupational therapy evaluation. So again, regardless, underscoring the importance of, um, of a secondary report whenever possible. Yes? Um, just a couple of observations as an occupational therapist in an acute hospital setting. Mm -hmm. um, there have been occasions where I've found cognitive difficulties with self-care or function, and in discussing with family members, they minimize it and pass it off as social issues or, or um, other things. Or the family member has been giving care and they sort of can't see the forest for the trees and they don't realize how things have spun out and gotten much more involved, they're getting much more cues than what they realize the person really isn't functioning at, mm -hmm. at such a reported higher level. Yeah, no, so again, when somebody is diagnosed with memory loss or cognitive impairment, it impacts the whole family. So if someone, you tell a daughter who's working full time that mom needs 24 hour care, that's gonna rock her world terribly. The other thing about being in the acute setting too is always, it sometimes, even though we see things that seem a lot worse, but in the, the lens of acute illness magnifies deficits terribly. And so that's why I actually kind of like my job now in the skilled, skilled rehab world, is that I, can, I have a chance over time to see them recover from their cognitive impairment and really be able to make, a, I think, a little bit better informed because they no longer have hypoxia or they're now two, day, you know, two weeks out of their pneumonia or things like that and it allows me a, a better assessment of um, functional capability. So if possible, even though those recommendations, if they're going home, these are concerns you need to really address in this setting. But I always, if you can get the tincture of time on your side and send them to a, a skilled or supportive environment while these things are working out, I think it's in everyone's best interest, if they're agreeable. And plus you'll have other people. They'll have all the other occupational therapists there will chime in and the doctors and the social workers and so there'll be more people instead of just a one-on-one -on -one conversation. Yes. I mean, I'm a psychiatric nurse practitioner, mm -hmm. so I deal with chronically, persistently mentally ill patients. They may not have any support systems out there except for a case manager. They may not want you to talk with the case manager or you're suspecting that things are going wrong, you're doing the things. Yeah. How do you get that more information and work around that? So it, sometimes, it, in my mind, it depends on acuity and direct threat to the patient. So if I don't have, if they're in the hospital or in an acute setting and I think they've overdosed and I'm not sure exactly what's going on or I mean it, to me it depends really on acuity if, if the patient has a life-threatening thing going on or a personal safety issue um, that's usually what it will prompt me to to reach out depending on the situation sometimes it's a reach out to the pharmacy <laughs> to see whether they've filled you know filled their scripts or other things it really depends on the person and the issue but you're right it's a very very touchy thing sometimes you just got to call it the way you see it you know you know, and, and it can be very difficult, especially in acute settings too. Um, for example, um, if you have a patient who at 11 o'clock every night for the week she's been there, all of a sudden is having severe agitation or, or behaviors in the middle of the night. The question is, is this sundowning and she has these, these behaviors at home because she lives independently and we're just seeing them because we're here with her at 11 o'clock at night in the hospital or are they real things? So in, when in doubt, I mean, you have to think about the safety of the patient, and I think that would be the advice I would give. You know, hip, hip is very good for protecting, but if it protects so well that it'll kill somebody, then you need to call somebody. So, that's my thought. <laughs> so, yes? I'd just like to comment that one of the things that I've found very helpful um, in the clock drawing, clock drawing is actually quite sensitive. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I, I do house calls almost exclusively now, and often I will go into a home and clearly I can pick up at the very get-go that the person has dementia and the family is saying, oh, you know, she's getting a little forgetful, but that's what happens when you get older and, and they're sort of minimizing it. Mm -hmm. And when you do the clock drawing in front of family, the family is often astounded at the abnormality of the clock drawing. And, and it sort of makes it possible to open the conversation. So. I find that actually very useful. I, that's usually the first thing I do. It's funny you say that. I did the exact same thing when I was working in the geriatric assessment clinic. I would show them the top. We used the mocha there, and I, I would show them the top line of the mocha, the, tr the mini trails. I would show them um, the mini trails, their cube drawing, and their clock. And I, that's all I would have to show. And then we, we could have a real conversation. And again, even that sometimes isn't enough, especially if there's visual impairment. But again, 
objective data wins almost all of us over. So those same people say, well, okay, I know, you don't, I know you don't think anything's going on, but can you just look at the checkbook and let me know if she lets you? <laughs> and then it'll, they'll start looking in the checkbook and realize that things haven't been paid and things like that. So the more objective data, it really does help, help in um, winning families and coalescing them to help, help the individual. All right, well, thank you so much for your attention. Have a, enjoy the rest of your day.